figured it out. I figured it out from black and white. In nature, in human life, everywhere around us, everything flows and it gets emptied and then replenished. If something does not get replenished, it dries out and dies out. Even in secular positions, people get burned out. Um, today, I would like to touch upon some aspects of religious education. I believe that there are three major fields where our children get educated. The most important field is the family. They are born in the family. God trusts them with adults to take care of them. So there is no better person that can choose a place for your education than God. If God chooses this particular couple to take care of this particular kid, that's the first environment where that kid is going to be educated. And I believe that the education starts from the moment of pregnancy. And the mother educates that kid throughout the pregnancy, and then after that, it continues until the day that we close our eyes and die. The education starts from the very first moment to the last moment. And that's the first field of education. The second field of education is religious education, now we're talking about, is the church, because that's where we come to uh, participate in the services, hear the sermons of the priest or other people. And the third one now is the church school. I don't want to call it Sunday school, I want to call it church school, because that's where we do our education, and it can be any day. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. I think that you all know that the reason it was on Sunday, because people didn't work on Sundays, and that was not meant to be a religious education school, but it was meant to be an adult education school where people who didn't know how to write and read would come on Sunday after the liturgy, they would go to the school and they would learn how to read and write. And slowly, slowly, that model changed into religious education because the public schools started educating the younger generations and the older generation who was not educated went away. So then we don't need that model anymore and we need the religious education to take over that institution. So these are the three aspects of religious education. I want to mention another field that affects the religious education in a negative way. That is also a form of education. That is the world. It can be the public school, it can be the sports grounds, it can be the marketplace, it can be the TV, it can be our friends. Anything that can either positively but most likely negatively draw us away from our goal of becoming saints. That's our goal. Throughout the Bible study, I have mentioned a few times that our goal of studying the Bible is not so that we memorize what Jesus was teaching. That's very wrong because we are not memorizing ethical code. Christianity is not about code. It's about life. And so the reason we are studying the Bible is by the words of St. John, only for our salvation. If you have any other reason to study the Bible, you can take the Bible and go home and read it. And you can figure out how you want to learn it. But the only way you can learn how to be saved is in the church. And although today we say that that's an old expression, but I believe that there is no salvation outside of the church. And I will say in a few minutes why. And so we have all these three aspects. We have the family, we have the church, and we have the school, and then the fourth one is kind of separate by itself, the whole world that is kind of drawing us either closer to Christ or further away from Christ. And our goal is to use all these three positive fields to support our walk towards Christ, which is our salvation. And so I think those three fields have to work together. In a modern study, they have find out that it is not at the college age that we lose our children from the church, but we lose them way before that, maybe in the middle school. And the reason we recognized earlier that we're losing the kids at the college age, because that's when they get their freedom, and all this time they have been holding their breath, 
and s waiting until they can get the freedom and then they're gone. And that's what we registered. Oh, we lost our children. You had lost your children a long time ago. The second thing that they have noticed is that the reason we lose our children is not because we are not or haven't created fun church. You cannot compete with the fun of the world. You cannot create enough entertainment in the church to beat the world. You cannot create Disneyland in, in the church. The reason we are losing the children is because we have lost the parents a long time ago. And it is not the church that has lost the children, but it's the parents that have lost the children because they have been lost a long time ago. Children get detached from the church for two reasons that happens in the family. Their parents either are not adequate enough in their knowledge to answer their questions or what they say that don't practice. So that, in an innocent child's mind, creates compromise. And they say, well, if my mother says this and it doesn't do it, it's okay if I don't either learn it or I do the same thing. Or, if this was an important thing, my mommy or my daddy would know the answer. If he and she doesn't know, it means that it hasn't been important. So we are the role model for the children, and we teach them by example. There is a book I have told my Bible study group called Encounter, where Anthony Bloom shows that it's the encounter that matters. Everything that we learn from the books, even the things that we memorize, the prayers or whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter. He has a beautiful example. He says, you cannot bring anyone to Christ until they see Christ on your face. It's the extension of an old expression that comes from the 4th century and it comes to us through Seraphim of Sorrow where it says, encounter the Spirit of God and thousands will be saved around you. If not even one person is being saved around you, the only reason for that is that we haven't encountered a spirit. That's it. You may know all the encyclopedias about the Bible and the church and everything and it's not going to help. So where does the encounter come in? Christ called his disciples through an encounter. He had a relationship with them. When John and Andrew follow Jesus, they say, we want to come and see where you stay. That's a form of encounter, encounter to see. It's as if me saying, I want to come to your house as a guest. Before I come to your house, I will have different relationship with you than after I come to your house that will be a, a, a deeper and closer relationship. Another encounter that Jesus always uses is to break bread with someone. We have the travelers of Emmaus who travel with Jesus, they have an intelligent conversation, but in the process they don't recognize who it is. They were telling Jesus about him. Haven't you heard that there was this man, Jesus, who has been crucified? And Christ is probably smiling. And they walk a long distance. And then when they go inside into a house, he breaks the bread and they recognize. And they say, our hearts burn in our chests. All this time we were walking with him. So it is the burning of the heart that is important for recognizing Christ, for being with him. If we cannot have our children's hearts burn in their chests, it doesn't matter what we put in their heads. They're just going to go and empty it somewhere. And the world is out there to help us. They say that every time we learn something, we forget something else in the back. So it's like if you put it in a linear way, this is the earliest thing we have learned, and this is the newest thing we have learned. When we learn something new, that old one gets deleted from the back. That can be the things that we have learned when we were five years old, so we don't even remember that it's there, but it's there. And we want to learn something new, that thing gets deleted from there. Another thing that the holy monks do in, in the monasteries is that they constantly recite the psalms. The reason for the recitation of the psalms so many times throughout the day continuously is to wash their brains. Yeah. Brainwashing has a negative connotation. But in this aspect, in this field, Washing the brain has actually a positive thing where your brain is literally considered dirty and by putting the bleach of the psalms 
you're actually cleaning it and presenting it to, to, to the Lord. So the learning that happens in the Sunday school, out of 168 hours, we use only one. So we put in our kids' heads one hour, and they erase what we have put in one hour, 167 hours. So we are constantly spinning our wheels, and we cannot do anything about it. And we say, oh, the church is dying. Oh, the Sunday school is going away. So what needs to be done is that now that we know what the cause of our problem is, that's the most important thing, we identify the problem, and then we think about solutions. The solutions may not be perfect, and they may not happen overnight. But we at least know what is the problem, so we don't cry about it. We know, you know, this is what we do, and it's wrong. And this is what the result is going to be. If you throw a stone in the lake, you're going to have ripples, and you, you can't complain about it. You keep throwing the stone in there. So, what has to happen, now we're getting to kind of the solution part of this, is that these three fields that I mentioned have to work in harmony with each other. The families, the church, and the school. To be honest, not to offend anyone, the school is not that important. If the church and the family worked in harmony, and the parents took seriously their church experiences, the school would not be necessary. A modern proof for that. There is one church in this world, Coptic church, that does not have seminaries, but they still produce priests. How do they do this? And they have excellent priests, not just a mediocre priest. They have excellent priests. I have been in one of their churches. The questions of the youth of that church were so nuanced and detailed from the Bible, from the New Testament, that I answered their questions, but I was impressed how deep their knowledge was. And that's how they prepare their priests. They locate someone, and the priest takes him under his wing and goes through it every single day. And that is called encounter. So this kind kid, nice kid, faithful kid, has an encounter with another person who has an encounter with Christ. And they actually do produce very wonderful priests, very devout priests. So if you can produce a priest without a school, without a seminary, you can easily produce faithful without one hour out of 128, putting kids in the classroom and trying to teach them something, and they jump all over the place, and you don't, you know, you're trying to put them in their seats, and they jump again, and you get back to them. And then, oh, it's time to go home. Yeah. Education is over. So what has to happen is this three fields have to work together. We are blessed to have the school. We have already established it. We have curriculum. We have good teachers. We are going to use that. Again, this is not going to happen overnight. It will start from you, from the school teachers. I can't talk about the parents now because the parents are not here. If I was talking to the parents, I would tell them it's going to start from you guys. <laughs> now, what can we do as Sunday school teachers? What is it that we can do? The most important thing that we need to have encounter with Christ. That's the bottom line. We need to have every day, every hour, striving hard towards God. We cannot imitate our children and dedicate to God only one hour of 168 hours of the week. Even the saints, when they talk about the prayer, they use this model. They say, people complain that we pray and our prayers are not heard by God or God doesn't answer our prayers. And then if you reflect on people's lives, they pray when their you know, finger hurts and they say, Lord, can you please fix my finger? And then they go on with their life. So they had spent only maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds of requesting something, and then they don't pay attention. They're going with their life. And God is constantly answering their question, but they don't hear it, because they're busy. So the same thing happens with our lives. If we spend our entire life in another field, another aspect of life, and then just one hour in the religious education aspect, our children are going to immediately catch it and say, well, what is said, is said in this classroom is just words coming out of somebody's mouth. It's just theoretical, mind-produced 
education that does not make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Because it's not scientific. It is scientific and it is not scientific. It's not scientific if you just do it theoretically. If you talk about it, you can't prove it. If you say there is God, there is no another sentence that proves that there is God. It is scientific if it ceases from being just words. When it becomes your life, when you have an encounter with Christ, then you can prove that there is God without even words. Francis of Assisi would tell his disciples, let's go and preach about Christ and use words if necessary. So words are not necessary to preach Christ. Life is necessary to preach Christ. And people who ask me about proof for God, I always tell them that, that we have cloud witnesses. They have proven throughout 2,000 years every single day. There is no room in our calendars to fit the saints. You know, we just read their names. We don't have time to read their lives. So if you want to find proof for God's existence, you have gazillions of examples. And it is scientific. What is science? Science is saying that if you want to prove something right, you have to be able to reproduce it. If I let my phone go, it will fall on the desk. And if it's big enough, it will break the desk and it will go on the floor. And that is because there is gravity. And if I do that a million times, that will happen over and over again. And you can't tell me that there is no gravity because it happened a million times. What the church has done throughout the 2,000 years is more than a million times. As I said, you know, a gazillion times, people have done the same thing, have gotten the same result. What is that? They have lived a holy life and they have encountered Christ. And it's very simple. You could see Christ in their face, and there was no argument about that. And the miracles were to, just for those who did not believe that that is possible. So there is no problem to prove that there is God. Because we have trillions of examples that they have done the same exact thing, and they have gotten the same exact result, which is the existence and the presence of God. If people are not satisfied with this kind of explanation, the other the harder explanation is you can try yourself and test it and find out if it's possible or not. And if you diligently try what the saints have tried to do, you'll get the same result, then I don't have to prove you anything. Okay? You will prove it to yourself. And only then you can prove the kids that what you're teaching is true. But if you have just learned something from the books and you go tell them and then they see you're practicing something different, in this case, it's the family, the parents, um, that they don't see the teachers, then it's going to create a compromise in their head, it's going to create a disharmony in their heads, and because they are very honest, they will take the side of the honesty and say, this is garbage, I'm going to do what is true. And that's when the world comes in, and the schools help our kids to do what is the right thing or what is proven that is to be right and you can pr examine it and you can reproduce it and it's the science. Science comes and says there's no God. And why can the school and the science prove us wrong is because we, we don't produce saints anymore. I was working at the Episcopal Church. I said I want to teach the kids about the saints. Well, we have saints until 1500s. We have not produced saints since then. That means that you haven't lived for 500 years a holy life. Same thing is in the Armenian church because of all the persecutions and stuff. People haven't been able to concentrate on themselves. They're always running away from the Turks. And so they don't have any saints. For 500 or 600 years, to, to have authentic saints is the power of the church. And who are those saints? They are not somebody in Mount Athos. They are not somebody in Greece. They are not somebody in uh, New York or in Canada. You are the saints. And the success of the church comes from becoming a saint. And it doesn't have to be, you know, I am here, I'm a sinful person, and then I'm, I get here and I'm a saint. It's a long process. It's a holy life. The saints are not perfect human beings. They are pe beings who pay attention to God at all times. And that's what we're talking about. 168 hours. If you're just one hour saint, that's not sufficient. If you are at least 100 hours saint, you can give that 60 hours to the fun and spend that 100 hour and 
holy, have a holy life. And then we'll start reflecting. And this is biblical. Christ says, shine your lights in front of the Gentiles and they will see your light and they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. He doesn't say go and learn uh, rhetorics and go and tell people where God is or doesn't say go learn science and prove that there is God. Simple, shine your light and they will see it and they will glorify your Father. So this has to happen in all parts of this triangular, connected, harmonious environment. You need to do because we're talking to you. It starts from you because you're present here in the school. It has to transpire into the families. The parents have to leave this because, like we said, in one hour you can't do what the parents can do in the rest of the 167 hours. And it has to be happening in the church also in the community. If you go into a room and there is an angry person there, what do we say? The atmosphere is so thick you can cut it with a knife. And what happens when you go in there? Just quietly sit in the corner. You know, you don't want to mess with anybody. What does this mean? It means that the atmosphere affects you to behave a certain way. If a child comes into the church and there is the atmosphere of holiness, the child is going to react to that atmosphere and behave a certain way. I'm going to make you tired with quoting Anthony Bloom. But he says that a mailman came to his church in London delivering something and it was in the middle of the liturgy. So when he came inside of the church, because there was a service going on, he didn't want to interrupt anybody. And he asked, they said, it's going to be almost over. So he scooted into one of the chairs and sit there with a package waiting. And then when it was over, Anthony comes out and uh, knows the mailman, takes the package. And this mailman says, you know, when I was sitting here, I felt there was something strange happening in this place. Is it the incense smell like <laughs> making me dizzy or... It's the candlelights maybe flickering and creating weird feelings. Or it may be the hysteria, that's what he says. The hysteria of the believers that makes me dizzy. Anthony <laughs> Bloom says, I don't think it's either of that. <laughs> if you are asking me, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that is making you feel, in other words, encounter God. And he says, he shook his hand and left. But he couldn't get away from it. He took it with him. He says that after a week he comes back and says, Your Eminence, I want to come to your church when there is nobody there. I want to come when there are no candles, no incense, and even you are not there, I'm going to sit there and see if I feel the same thing. He says, sure, sure, here's the keys. We can go open the door and go inside. It's even worse. Yeah, when you go into the church and there's nobody there, you're sitting there, all the saints are staring at you, and it's dark. You know, he goes in there and he comes out like, Whoa, there is something going on in there. So he says... A few months later, this man became Orthodox and joined the church. And he believed that there was actually presence inside of the church. And that you cannot explain it, but it's there. So what does this say? If you had taken this man to the seminary, and I'm going to tell you that a lot of atheists come out of the seminaries. Best example is Stalin, who killed millions of people, was a graduate of a seminary. And when he had become the prime minister of Russia... His mother visited him, and after she was so disappointed, when she was saying goodbye to him, she said, I wish you had become a priest. I'm reading a diagram that's stuck with him for decades. That expression? Yep, it's stuck with him. And every time someone, like, said something to him, like, remotely like that, he's like, Stop, my mother, like, every time. So, if we had taken this man and put him in a seminary, we could have created an atheist. <laughs> but because we stuck him in the church, in two or three experiences or in two or three encounters with the Holy Spirit, his heart and mind was changed. And he started willingly walking towards Christ. The Holy Spirit brings him to his way, which is Christ, and then he continues walking on his own. You don't do anything. What you do is to keep that atmosphere. That atmosphere is the atmosphere created by the prayer. Because Christ says, where two or three are gathered in my name, in agreement... I am there with them. So, in the liturgy, we say, when we are consecrating the gifts, we know, Lord, that you are in heaven, but at the same time, you are present here with us. And therefore, please change this bread into your body, and change this wine into your blood. And that, we believe, that actually happens. And if the dead bread, it's literally dead, right? We prick it, 
we grind it, we bake it, we kill it completely. It's better to eat wheat than bread, they say, right? It's, it's better for you, because it's not killed, all the vitamins inside. So if the dead bread can transform into the body of Christ in the church, and the dead wine can transform into the blood of Christ, then a human being that enters into the church can be transformed into Christ-like creature. So that is the third place. And do we do believe that Christ does it? If we believe in the New Testament, he transformed the water into wine. Physically, people taste it and they said this was actually better than the one we had before. And uh, my friend uh, Rosemary said this is when he was alive, so it doesn't happen in a church anymore. And a Catholic church, of course, they, she didn't know about the Orthodox church. And my question was, oh, is Christ dead now? She said, no, 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 he's, he's not, because she's a devout Protestant Christian. She believes that Christ, well, I said, if Christ is still alive, he did this when he was in Jerusalem or in Cana of Galilee. Then he does it every Sunday or every time we celebrate the liturgy because he's still alive, still present, and he still transforms the gift into his body and blood. And so, he also, as at Anthony Bloom's church, he is also transforming us into his brothers and sisters and children of God. So that is in the second place, which is, we, we talked about the Sunday school, that is our transformation. Our transformation happens in the church, and our children's transformation happens in the church also, without the knowledge that we give them. And the third is the family, and their transformation also happens in the church, through the Holy Spirit, but they need to keep it. They need to continue, because it's again one hour. It's not too much. And John Chrysostom talks about how we keep our encounter with Christ at least throughout Sunday. Forget about the other six days. At least on Sunday, we keep it. What do we do? I have heard people drop their kids at Sunday school, and they run to Dunkin' Donuts. This was happening in the Armenian church. Or, the Sunday school was in a basement, they would bring the kids to the Sunday school, and they would wander around in the hallways, and the liturgy was happening upstairs. They wouldn't bother to go upstairs, at least sit there. So, what we do, even when we go into the church, we stay there one hour, we encounter Christ, and then we go and do whatever we have to do, to the mall or everywhere, so that we don't break that one hour rule. You know, it's one hour out of 168. John Chrysostom compares this to taking a bath. Now, in America, <coughs> we're spoiled. We take a bath or a shower twice a day. They weren't taking twice a day. They were taking once a week. And they would go to the public bath. They wouldn't take it in their homes. So he compares spiritual encounter of Christ or the Holy Spirit with the bath. And he says, if you want to grow in Christ, you can't take a bath and then go and start modeling in the dust, going to the marketplace. He says, when you take a bath on that particular day, you go home, you put your nicest clothes on, and you recline on the sofa or whatever you have, and you enjoy your cleanness that one day that you're off. And then the next day, whatever, you know, you go to work and you get dirty again. But you at least have one day of cleanness. And then he brings this into the church. He says, when you come to church, you take Christ in you, he cleanses you. When a priest takes communion, the response after taking the blood is, this has touched my lips, has cleansed my sins, meaning that I have been transformed in complete way. Then, Christostom says, when you come to church and take communion and listen to the gospel, which is another form of cleaning you, Go home, don't do anything else all that day. Open the Bible, the same passage, and sit with your kids and your wife or whatever, your husband, and you meditate on that all day. Make that one day dedicated to God. And that is a very Jewish approach. Sabbath is supposed to be God's day. The rest could be yours. That one day was supposed to be God's day. And we see even Christ kept that rule. Every time we see him in the synagogue, it's Sabbath. And he does God's work. He heals people. They are misunderstanding him. They're trying to throw him off the cliff and whatever. But on Sabbath days, he is with the people and teaching them and preaching them and having an encounter 
with them. So, that's what our parents have to do. Now, these are all theories. Like I warned you in the beginning, I'm going to bring you the theoretical part. And you can go figure it out, practical application of it. How are you going to do this? An Armenian priest, who was a musician and a victim of the genocide, when he was talking to the Sunday school teachers of the time, he said, you have the most delicate job. By being a religious education instructor, you are either going to create a marvelous society, or you're going to destroy the next generation. You either create that marvelous society, or don't take any sins on your soul shoulders. Christ says something very important. He says to the Pharisees, you go travel mountains and valleys, find the person, and make them child of Gehenna. What does that mean? On the surface, we're always trying to convert somebody. When we convert them, by our own example, we make them worse than they were before their conversion. So that's a very delicate job. As a priest, my job is maybe a little bit more delicate than yours. Before you take on upon a very important and delicate job, you need to know how to do it. And that's where the replenishment comes. None of us, in purpose, does something to harm or hurt somebody. But if I dry out as a priest, and I come and stand there like this for the liturgy, and there is no light in my eyes, and there is no energy, and I bore you with my sermons, it's like, oh, he keeps repeating the same thing over and over, because it doesn't have anything new. It's not because I want to hurt you. It's probably because... I burnt myself out, and there is nothing that I can actually communicate to you, and in my face you don't see Christ. So it becomes an artificial thing. Um, and that's why this is very important. I said in the Bible study that I don't know your lives, and when we are talking about the Bible and teachings of Christ, I say what I think is in there. It may be hurtful for someone whose life I don't know, and there is something sensitive, what I said, about that particular person's life. So please uh, consider that. I didn't mean to. We, we go away from God. That is hell. And it can start here. We get closer to God. It's the kingdom of heaven. And it starts here. So we can actually experience it right away. Right now. Here now. I have said in the Bible study. Father Porphyrios or Abba Porphyrios or Saint Porphyrios now. Has that beautiful expression. Stretch it gently. And that is proven by John the Baptist. When the soldiers come to him and say, what should we do to inherit the kingdom of God? He says, go and don't do more than you are commanded to do. Meaning, there is a long way to become a member of the kingdom of heaven. But you've got to start from the first step. Every journey starts from the first step. You can't jump a mile. You need to go one step at a time. And like Porfirio says, you have to do it gently so that you don't hurt yourself. You don't discourage yourself. Don't get tired of what you're doing. But one small step at a time. And then he says to the tax collectors, don't take more than what you're supposed to take. That's another first step. Zacchaeus says, I paid fourfold to those of I wronged, and I gave half of my wealth to the poor. John the Baptist does not require that from the crowd. He gives them the first smallest possible step. And uh, the wise spiritual fathers, when they were listening to the confession of their children, and then they had to give them advice, they would say, okay, this is what I'm going to tell you needs to happen. You tell me how much can you do. And then if you cannot do even what you promised to do, next time when we meet, tell me how much was actually practically possible to do, but something has to be done. You can't say, that's too much, I'm not going to do it. Do as much as you can, and add one hair to it every day. And that's going to be the best way. One of my friends would use the example of the water dripping. If you pour a cistern or container of water on a rock, what's going to happen to the rock? Nothing. If you drip that water throughout time on the stone, it's going to crack the stone. So the small steps are more important than jumping ahead and doing the big thing. 
One last thing, and I'll finish, to prove that with Christ's example and an encounter, when Christ calls his uh, first six disciples, when he calls John and Andrew, they come to his house, which is the Holy of Holies, where Jesus is, that's where the Holy of Holies is. So when they go to his house, they're actually entering into the Holy of Holies. They encounter God's presence, and what do they do first thing? They call their brothers. They run out of his house, and they can't wait until they find their brother. I found the Messiah. Come, come see him. We can be like that. And then when Peter and James come and see Christ, they encounter him too. What do they do? They call their friends, Philip and Nathaniel. Come, we have found the Messiah. And they come too. What does Jesus do? He sends them away. I don't want you. Why? Because they were excited. Because they were out of themselves. And what does he do? He leaves them and he goes into the desert. And he stays there 40 days. And then in that process, in that 40 days or whatever, or after that or whatever, John the Baptist gets beheaded and it shocks the disciples. They don't want Jesus or anybody. What do they do? I have said this in a funny way. When you don't want company, you don't want to deal with anybody, what do you do? Go fishing. Right? You put on on your door. Go on fishing. Nobody's home. So what what do John, Andrew, Peter, and James do? They go fishing. And then when they are relaxed, fishing is the most relaxing thing. When you're calm and relaxed, you're doing your daily life, that's when Jesus appears the second time. And says, John, Andrew, Peter, James, come and I will make you fishers of men. 